Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Family Law Talk, presented by Kirk Stenge of Stenge Law Firm, PC. Stenge Law Firm is a family law firm in the St. Louis metro area, with offices in Missouri and Illinois. Now, here's your host, Kirk Stenge. Welcome to Family Law Talk. This is Kirk Stenge, and today we have an exciting episode on Family Law Talk with Stenge Law Firm. The topic is parental alienation, myth or monster. Today we've got a special guest with us today, uh, Dean Tong. Dean, you on the phone with me today? I am. Uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, thanks for coming on the show. We're going to get to the topic here in just a second, but I'll state, as I always do, that the choice of a lawyer is an important decision that should not be based solely upon advertisements and that the information you obtain today is general in nature and it may not apply to a specific factual or legal circumstance. Therefore, if you need legal advice, you should definitely consult an attorney who is licensed and competent to practice law in your specific jurisdiction. All right, so on to the topic. Again, the topic is parental alienation myth or monster, and I have Dean Tong on the phone with me today, and Dean is a forensic trial expert and author, um, so it's a pleasure to have you on the phone, sir. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having uh, me Could again. you tell the listeners? Sure. Absolutely. Can you tell the, tell the listeners what is parental alienation? Because a lot of folks probably don't understand what that is. Yeah, it's a very common uh, <clears throat> Uh, phenomenon we see in high conflict divorces and parenting disputes and custody battles where one parent will berate or denigrate or vilify the other parent, uh, oftentimes in front of the child, to turn that child against the other parent. So it really is, in essence, counsel, a, a form of emotional, mental, or psychological child abuse, which, of course, makes it relevant for this month, April, the National Child Abuse Awareness and Prevention Month. Who's usually the alienator and who's usually the target uh, of that well, alienation? That's, yeah, that's that's where the that's where the uh, the caption myth or monster comes in because oftentimes, of course, as you know, as as an attorney, uh, men and fathers are accused um, in high conflict divorces of child abuse, so oftentimes sexual abuse, which is my expertise. Um, and and I'm not trying to gender bias this because it, it hits women and mothers as well. But oftentimes, the you know the left side, um, the leftists will will say that you know fathers are are using this as a weapon or tool to falsely accuse protective mothers and good mothers um, in, in getting custody. And of course, um, uh, in my specialty, false or unfounded allegations of child sexual abuse within high conflict divorces and custody battles. Uh, you know, we only see about 5% of these allegations as being maliciously false. So most of the times when it's unfounded by DCF or DSS or DHS, whatever it's called in your state there in, in, in Missouri, the show-me state, uh, the reality is uh, most of these are mistakes or are unfounded. There's another reason for why the kid is saying what he or she is saying, or, or you know, there's another plausible explanation for what's going on with the child other than, other than uh, trauma or abuse. When is someone most likely to be victimized by parental alienation? I'm sorry? Yeah, when is someone most likely to be victimized by parental alienation? Well, oftentimes, um, you know, you'll see this coming, like I said, in a high conflict divorce or custody battle. Um, you may get hit with an ex parte, um, you know, order for protection from abuse. Uh, it'll hit you, uh, you know, like, like a back door hits you. Uh, you won't see it coming. And uh, the timing is oftentimes uh, a red flag as to whether it was made maliciously uh, as a tool to get custody of the kid or, or kids or, or not. So, um, you know, you have, you have good faith allegations, you have bad faith or malicious allegations, you have unfounded allegations where, you know, perhaps the government, uh, the police, and, 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 and the Child Protection Services are not conducting an objective, competent investigation. Uh, what we call psychology source monitoring, <clears throat> and and like I say, uh, uh, you know they they diagnose it as, as abuse, and and experts come in and say it's not. <clears throat> so uh, the problem with alienation is once the kids buy into the denigration or vilification of the accused, the targeted parent, uh, in time, the child actually believes what the alienating parent is is saying about the other parent. So that's the problem, and, and, you know, in my caseload, I've been doing this for a long time, 
when the kid gets up to the adolescent teenager age, it's very hard to turn those kids around without re- reintegration, reunification therapy. You mentioned the timing, which I thought was, uh, uh, which I thought was interesting. You said that sometimes the timing uh, at times can kind of red flag uh, a particular allegation. Could you explain that in a little more detail, what you mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is if you have a doctored hearing uh, on a petition for order to show cause or, you know, um, some type of evidentiary hearing coming up uh, where you're going to present witnesses, evidence, and testimony, and facts, and data, and science, maybe even experts uh, to articulate your case. And all of a sudden, um, you know, a week before that hearing, bingo, your client gets hit with this ex parte protection order from abuse perhaps a mandated reporter called it in because the therapist was seeing the kid or or, or a doctor or pediatrician uh, or a dentist was seeing the kid and called it into the government and that, that kind of, it just nullifies your hearing. All of a sudden, uh, you know, a, a, another judge is taking in, in rem emergency jurisdiction and trumping and trumping your hearing. <clears throat> so that that could be a, 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 you know, sign of a vindictive uh, a vindictive uh, weapon or tool to use the kid uh, as ammunition to stop your hearing while that you know that party that litigant that parent is uh, is orchestrating perhaps in bad faith uh, not necessarily but oftentimes you know that could be the case um, to you know to stop your hearing um, and and basically you know put you put your client under the legal microscope while that while that while that litigant is obtaining equity in law and court. Um, right. That's absolutely right. Um, uh, in terms of parental alienation, is, is it a bona fide science that can pass a Dalbert test standard in court? Well, that's that 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 you know that's the myth or monster uh, uh, problem right there. It's it, it's not in the DSM five. DSM hyphen the number five is our current diagnostic and statistical manual. That's our bible of mental health disorders. That was published uh, about two years ago, May of 2013. That's what uh, America is going under right now, the DSM-5. So the word alienation is not in there uh, as such. Uh, however, Dr. Bernay from Tennessee, William Bernay, uh, B-E-R-N-E-T, he's an MD psychiatrist, he was uh, effective in uh, lobbying the DSM-5 committee to, uh, to put alienation in that Bible uh, in, in, in other forms, in other words. So we have codes now. One is called parent-child relation, relational problem, uh, which is VL code 61.20. We have another one, uh, which is called child psychological abuse. And we have yet another one, which is called child affected by parental relationship distress. So those are the three that in, in, in totality actually e- equal estrangement or, 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 or alienation. Again, the word alienation is not in there per, per se, but these are the three that, you know, you as a lawyer would be, would be offering the court uh, through expert testimony, of course, that your client's child is, is being victimized by. Now, that may require you to file a motion for IME, uh, you know, uh, psychiatric or psychological examination uh, of the entire uh, family, uh, global cuts evaluation, or or of the child uh, at bar. Um, as a lawyer, you know, you would do that <laughs> and uh, offer, of course, CVs of, of experts uh, to the court who might who might uh, you know the court appoint to do that. <clears throat> but now we have three actual diagnoses in the DSM that, even though they're not alienation per se. Uh, they pretty much go to the same to, to the same word. What what's the normal treatment for kids that have uh, uh, suffered damage from parental alienation? In other words, what what type of treatment or therapy can these kids get? Well, uh, it would be the same thing as as, as other types of abuse. Um, when a therapist has seen a child who's been uh, a victim of abuse, or or a child who has been um, Treated as if uh, she's she or he's been abused, but really hasn't been abused. Um, you know, a mistake, a false allegation. So, so in, in a child uh, under the age of uh, eight, say the under the age of reason, uh, that would be play therapy. 
uh, and then you get into the older children, uh, the abstract independent thinking age, um, you know, 10 to 12, and then and then the adolescent age, the, the teeny boppers, uh, 13 to 17. Uh, they use they use what's called cognitive behavioral therapy, <clears throat> CBT. So there are two types. There's abuse focused and trauma focused CBT. And of course, uh, it depends how how uh, bad off the kid has become as a result of the alienation. Is the child suffering psychosomatic signs and symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, headaches, stomach aches, bedwetting, um, other regressive behaviors? Um, you know, <clears throat> rocking back and forth, thumb sucking, curling up in a fetal position. I mean, I mean, it can get really bad. Post-traumatic stress disorder, self-mutilation, suicidal ideations. That's how bad this can get. We don't usually see the suicidal ideations or the, or the self-mutilations of the kids. Uh, you know, you usually turn 14, 15, or 16. What, what type of success is there with the, with kids that have reached adolescent age? Have been subjected to uh, parental alienation. Not, not good. Yeah, once, once Dr. Gardner, who was a colleague of mine, who actually formulated uh, this theory uh, 30 years ago, back in the mid 80s, uh, he died about a decade ago. Richard Gardner, a psychiatrist from New Jersey, uh, actually coined this parental alienation syndrome. <clears throat> you know, as an expert myself, uh, and as I'm sure as a lawyer, you. Uh, you don't like the word syndrome. Most judges don't like that word because it usually describes an anecdotal pattern of behavior. There's not a lot of scientific support because you, you know, you have battered women syndrome, you have Munchausen syndrome, you have all these syndromes, and, and judges don't usually like to hear the word syndrome. So as an expert, I try to shy away from the word syndrome, and I, I, I don't write that word in my reports. And when I'm testifying as an expert on the stand, you'll never hear the word syndrome coming out of my mouth. Uh, as far as uh, if I'm giving an opinion on a case, <clears throat> but um, the success rate once once the kid uh, has has hit what, what Dr. Gardner would call the severe stage, because there were three stages hit that he that he coined, uh, slight, moderate, and severe. Once they hit the severe stage, they're usually too far gone, and they just want they don't want to have anything to do with a targeted parent. <clears throat> So how does a parent spot it then before it gets to that severe stage? Are there different uh, yeah, things? Yeah, I mean, gotta, red flag. Well, yeah, you gotta you gotta spot this early on. Um, usually, by ages eight, nine, or ten, you know, uh, once they hit puberty, it can be uh, they you know it can be water over the bridge at that point, and, and the kid could be too far gone. So, uh, you know, you're looking for those signs or symptoms I just alluded to. You know, you're looking for uh, continual uh, uh, litigation. Dr. Gardner said that any case that went into extensive, protracted, contentious, high-conflict litigation uh, that was never-ending was was a sign of parental alienation. Uh, you know, extremely litigious litigants uh, is, is clearly a sign of vexatious litigant. So... Um, you know that that's you know that's another issue uh, that you know that the attorney and the client, the other client, uh, the, you know the, the targeted power would have to be privy to. But this is not often. This is not always the, the father or the male or the or the man who is the accused, who is the targeted parent. I, mean, I, I get clients that are mothers and women too, and you know now we get we get judges who believe moms falsely accused, uh, falsely accused dad of incest. Uh, the, you know moms who are accused of coaching. And and they are now the targeted parents. So it's not always the, the men or fathers. Right. Um, when, when you use this word coaching, can you explain what that means? Because that's a that's some yeah. I mean that phrase yeah, is something yeah, that certainly yeah, I've seen it, a lot of cases. It's a word it's a word counselor that's thrown around a lot um, in my in my practice. So obviously, I'm sure in yours too. Um, there's actually a page on my website which. For your listening audience, is abuse-excuse.com is my website. And then if you click on Dean Tong Dedicated, and there's a page, Tong's Take on Coaching. So I actually devote an entire page of my website to coaching, what it is and what it isn't. So what it is is a premeditated, bad faith, malicious act. It's an act where a parent is taking a kid aside and educating, training, indoctrinating, conditioning, poisoning that kid to wrongly accuse the other parent. It's a malicious act, and in my state of Florida, 
under uh, under statute 39.205 subsection 9 it's it's actually a felony you can go to prison in my state now that we, you know we're one of only a handful of states in America that make it a felony in most states i think Missouri included uh, it's a misdemeanor and pretty much a slap on the wrist so there aren't too many deterrents from um, you know deterring a a parent who would maliciously falsely accuse another parent of abuse um, on the what, other what hand, what signs of coaching? Well, you get a you get a, a child who is, uh, appears to be rehearsed or scripted. So when I'm looking at the DVD interview of the kid at the CPC, the Child Protection Center, uh, with with DDCF or DSS or DHS, whatever it's called in your state, uh, I'm looking to see if the kid says, you know, mommy told me to say bad things about daddy. That would be consistent or tantamount with coaching. Um, you know, if a child is giving spontaneous, unrehearsed, unscripted, free recall, free narrative, free account uh, version of what what allegedly happened to the kid without any coercion or influence, and, and those statements appear to be reliable and trustworthy and valid, then that's probably, uh, if the child makes an outcry, that's probably a bona fide outcry. I was wondering if you could go into a little more detail on these on the stages of parental alienation. You alluded to it, but if you could explain to the listeners, you know, what these different stages are and, and how it looks like. Well, it, it escalates. Uh, you know, that that's that's what Gardner found out in his studies, uh, where he where he tapped this slight, moderate, and severe. So slight may be the five or six year old um, who is now being victimized by multiple interviews, multiple rape exams, uh, multiple pediatric visits and ER visits, um, possibly a parent who who may be um, trying to uh, make a diagnosis on his or her own. Uh, you know what we what we know as Munchausen syndrome now that's that's known as pediatric falsification disorder in the DSM. So a child who is starting to uh, ingratiate him or herself to the to the alienated parent but you know it still wants to see the targeted parent still loves the targeted parent uh but the more you keep that kid away from the targeted parent, if you violate court orders uh if you just you know don't allow the father or the mother to see the kid on the weekend uh pursuant to the court order then you just you just thumb your nose to the court orders um, you know, then, then obviously the kid is going to start showing allegiance to the uh, parent who is putting the house and shelter and clothes and food in that, uh, over that kid, uh, giving stability and permanency to that kid, which is the alienated parent. So basically the child becomes a victim of false delusions and starts believing the projection and everything that's being fed to that kid through that parent. Perhaps a therapist is bought in. Uh, mother, you know, maybe the mother or father has unilaterally shopped the kid to a therapist to corroborate that parent's delusions that the other parent is a bad parent that has molested the kid or whatever. And then, of course, it escalates. The behaviors will escalate. The the signs, the symptoms, and trauma of the kid escalate. And now we get to the moderate stage, as Gardner referred to it. And then, of course, when the kid just doesn't want to see the targeted parent over multiple interviews, multiple therapy sessions you know, indoctrination by the entire alienating family doesn't want to see the targeted family at all, including the grandparents, siblings, etc. Now you've got a huge problem. The court is clearly left with a conundrum, uh, you know, what do I do to fix this problem in the best interest of the child? Because as you know, as a, as a litigator, that's the polar star. That's the litmus test. The best interest of the child trumps everything. So, <clears throat> You know, we, we then have to uh, court appoint multiple experts. We have to get a uh, reunification slash reintegration therapist. We've got to we've got to get a parenting coordinator involved who is privy to the research by Dr. Richard Warshak, Dr. Amy Baker. Um, you know, all these experts who have written on parental alienation. Uh, Warshak's uh, book, which became a bestseller, is called Divorce Poison. There's another book, good book by uh, Claymore and Rivlin uh, called Children Held Hostage. And I've written on this topic myself in, in my own books. Um, so, you know, in my own books, it's, it's mentioned not as an entire book devoted to it, but I have a chapter devoted to parental alienation in my book, Elusive Innocence. You had mentioned the parent coordinators, which I thought was interesting. In Missouri, we don't have a, a 
parent coordinator statute. In other words, judges can't order it. The parties can agree uh, uh, to a parent coordinator, and if they agree or consent to it, then the, then the court can appoint one. But absent that, uh, courts really don't have any statutory authority to do it. But I'm just curious, do you think a parent coordinator can help in cases with parental oh, alienation? Yeah, absolutely. And how so? Absolutely. And, and with all, well, with all due respect to the attorneys, uh, the guardians that light them or the attorneys that light them that come in, with all due respect to you guys, you're, you're lawyers. You know, you're trained in the law. You're not trained in psychology, mental health, behavioral science, or social science, unless you also have a Ph.D. So the reality is, um, you know, you tend to protract out the litigation. And we don't need that. That's what Gardner said we don't need. What we do need are experts who, you know, who, who, can, who can hit this hammer, this home of what it is, and, and get a cathartic therapeutic remedy as quickly as possible so that the signs of symptoms don't exacerbate with the child. So I find that parent coordinators in my state of Florida, other states such as Illinois, New Jersey, New York, California, they're all on the books. Uh, they're fantastic. They're, they're PhDs. They're published. They, they, you know, they know what's going on. They, they might have given seminars on this. And they've educated courts and triers of fact uh, around their states on this. And judges are amenable to this. Do you think parent coordinators help keep folks out of court, keep the repeat motions and, and litigation uh, commencing? I, I do. Yeah, yeah, I do, because, of course, the parent coordinator, uh, you know, like the custody evaluator who's court appointed has quasi-judicial immunity, will um, uh, ha has the unilateral power of going back to the court and saying, you know, uh, Mr. Jones is not acting in, in, in his child's best interest, or Mrs. Jones is not acting in, in, in her child's best interest. I think we need to do this, Judge. And, of course, the, the parent coordinator, just like the custody evaluator, would be the court's expert in the field. So that person can recommend whatever he or she wants to recommend. And usually a court will advocate to a rubber stamp uh, that, you know, that expert's recommendations. How do you tell between realistic estrangement and parental alienation? That, to me, has been uh, kind of a quandary in a lot of cases. I mean, there's some cases where I think out of the gates, it's it's hard to tell the difference. It's hard to tell when there's real abuse going on uh, versus a situation where alienation has taken place. Well, I think I think you know. Again, you got to have experts. I think you got to uh, you know you got to determine how how far has the case gone, has the alienating parent gone to the point of um, perhaps trying to secret the kid so far away from the targeted parent that the alienated parent takes the kid interstate to another state, perhaps internationally. Um, it, you know, it gets that bad, you know, basically child abduction. And, I mean, you know, you, you know as you know, a, you know, a litigant can go to however many states he or she wants to go to try to trump the jurisdiction, subject matter, personal jurisdiction in the state that has custody, can lie uh, in, in in his or her affidavit in the order for protection from abuse that there's not you know there's no pendente lite custody going on in the other state, and then all of a sudden under the UCCJEA both judges are talking to each other over, you know by telephone pursuant to the code, uh, but perhaps the attorney for the targeted parent doesn't file a notice of special appearance to to argue jurisdiction only, so therefore therefore the the complaining, uh, the complaining witness, the the alienated parent's allegations in in her in her affidavit or his affidavit are heard, based on their merits, and usually granted. So now you have a state that's Trump jurisdiction in the state that has custody, the full faith and credit state. So I see that a lot in my case load. Right, the multi-state issue is definitely. Uh definitely a big issue and obviously can increase the cost for the parties and make the litigation much more complex because now all of a sudden parties have to have att uh, attorneys in, in presumably two different states representing them, which increases yeah, the cost. Yeah, and, yeah, I, you know, and, 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 you know, fortunately, you know, I've, been, I've been doing this, uh, I've been doing this uh, for 30 years, professionally for 20 years in my practice, in my work, and I've been hired in cases from all 50 states. So I'm kind of a unique guy in that I have contacts from all 50 states. Uh, is there an age when it's just too far gone, where it's just too late to, to fix the damage of parental alienation? Yeah, yeah, I'm just going to throw this out there. Uh, it's 15. 15 has been like the real um, obstacle age uh, in my practice. 
that once once the kid gets gets to that age, uh, even if the targeted parent's attorney files a petition for in-camera interview and the kid is interviewed in chambers by the judge, the, the child is so ingratiated and enmeshed to the alienated parent that kid just wants nothing to do with the targeted parent. So it really doesn't matter what the targeted parent's attorney does; um, it, it, it's a lost cause. You might as well just so, wait so what the courts do in situations. What's that? So, so what? So what are courts to do in those situations where it's a child? Because I certainly <laughs> seen that you got a child oh, fifteen yeah, plus, yeah, and they've yeah. clearly been alienated. Yeah, I mean, you know, as you know, as you know, a child's in camera testimony is is pretty much the 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 number one criteria uh, when th- when that's listened to and heard. So, the child doesn't want to see a targeted parent. That's pretty much a game set match. So, I mean, t- targeted targeted parents gotta wait till the kid emancipates at least as the age of majority. So, so, not a good idea then to to force visits with with, uh, with the other parent if the child's fifteen plus. I mean, that uh, in your opinion, that wouldn't be the thing to do in most of these cases. Well, you know, I, I I obviously advocate and lobby for visitation, and I'm not just talking Skype and over the Internet. You've got to have that personal attachment theory, very, very important, uh, where where dad or, or mom and child see each other, uh, whoever the target parent is. But but the reality is, um, as, far as, as far as how it works, uh, it's a very slippery slope, and you know, um, you know, uh, a judge may order, might order supervised. Uh, in my state, it's no longer called custody or visitation. In my state, it's called time sharing here in Florida. Uh, but I mean, you know, a judge may order supervised visitation, and you've got to have a, a, a visitation supervisor who's going to be an objective third party. And of course, that person's uh, memorialized notes are going to be important for future uh, litigation purposes. If if it looks like the uh, you know, alienated parent is whispering um, signs or codes to the child. If they have some type of code system encrypted, uh, I've seen that in cases. Um, you know, it, it gets that bad. Is uh, parental alienation universally accepted by most courts? No, no. It's usually uh, jurisdiction state specific. Um, and, and, you know, the fact that it's not in the DSM-5 as parental alienation right there is objectionable, that it doesn't meet the Dauber criteria because it's not accepted by, by, by the American Psychiatric Association, uh, Association. The American Psychiatric Association publishes the DSM-5. So now you've got to get back to Dauber and, you know, is, is this theory or concept published in, in accepted peer-reviewed scientific journals, books, book chapters, well, it is. It is somewhat. Uh, I mean, you know, there's a recent book out um, authored by William Bernay, the same psychiatrist I just mentioned, um, out of Tennessee, uh, with, with uh, Desmothenus Lorandos, uh, Dr. Lorandos. He's a, he's a lawyer and a psychologist. His website is psychlaw.net. And so that's a really good book uh, that was published by, published by Charles C. Thomas uh, a few years ago. Uh, Dr. Warshak, who I mentioned, uh, he's been on. You know, he was on Oprah before she went off the air uh, on her show uh, with his book *Divorce Poison*. Dr. Amy Baker out of New Jersey. So you, you know, you just you have to do your homework as a lawyer and and have all and and you know you might have to file a motion for a Daubert hearing or perhaps the other lawyer will do so to you know you know have a Daubert challenge hearing and challenge you on the legal admissibility. So, you know, because you might get hit with a motion in limine that it's a uh, it's junk science. You know, this has been tapped as junk science many times because the protective mothers. You have two divisive camps here. You have the falsely accused fathers, and you have the protective mothers. Those are clearly two very divisive camps. So the lawyers for the protective mothers will file a motion in limine trying to strike your your you know your evidence on parental alienation as being junk science. You've got a counter with one of the top experts who's published in this field and who can corroborate his or her opinion with learned treatises uh, when they're on the stand. Have you testified in court as an expert regarding yes, parental alienation? I, yes, but I, I have, yes, in, in over a dozen states. And explain in terms of sexual abuse allegations and divorce, how does that interplay with 
uh, parental alienation? Well, I think they're joined at the hip. When when the allegations have been have been proven false, and, and when I when I say false, I mean either the uh, government, uh, DHS or DSS or DCF, whatever it's called in your state, uh, or the police have arrested the false accuser for a false police report. Um, as I stated, in my state of Florida, it's a felony. Uh, or a court has made a finding of fact conclusion of law after a merits hearing or trial, it, it's a false allegation. So, again, false is, is bad faith premeditated with malice aforethought. Most of these allegations are not false. Most of them are unfounded, what we call Swiss misattribution errors. There's another reason for why the child is saying what he or she is saying, uh, you know, a, a case of child victim hearsay where there's no corroborating physical medical evidence, which is the norm. There usually isn't corroborating physical medical evidence. Just the child's words is enough to send somebody to prison um, or, 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 or cause a dependency case in juvenile court or, or certainly supervised visitation in a family court uh, scenario. But um, the reality is about 5% of these cases are false and malicious false allegations. So those would be the cases where uh, that, you know, th those would be tantamount to coaching. Those would be cases... Um, of, of, of parental alienation, and in my in my professional opinion, that would be tantamount to emotional, mental, psychological child abuse of the kids. How can you tell the difference? How can you tell when when it's a, a malicious allegation being brought forth, or just a case where um, you know maybe the one parent brings the allegation in good faith, and they just turn out to be wrong? Right, right. So the most important piece of data we have, counsel, is that forensic interview on DVD. So the DVD interview at the Child Advocacy Center or the, or the Child Protection Center is usually done within, within 48 hours of the victim's outcry or disclosure or statement, and that's the most reliable piece of data we have. And then I have to, I have to peruse and pour over that interview as an expert to see what kind of methodology the interviewer is using, whether she's using NICHD or ATTAC or APSAC or, or Huntsville, uh, whatever, and and whether that interviewer used leading questions, suggestive questions, closed-ended versus open-ended questions, positive reinforcement, dolls, puppets, or drawings, cake, candy, or ice cream to get the desired responses that he or she was seeking, that's what I'm looking for. And what do you think is the appropriate way? I mean, is there, is there a preferred way uh, yeah. for that interview uh, yeah. that ought to be conducted? Yeah, yeah. yeah. the best practice methodology uh, and as you know, as a lawyer, uh, we have a best evidence rule. So obviously, best practice promulgates best evidence in court. Uh, would be called the NICHD, which stands for the National Institute for Child Health and Human Development, uh, which is a which is a faction of the NIH, National Institutes for Health in Bethesda, Maryland. So my colleagues, Dr. Phil Esplin and Dr. Michael Lamb. Dr. Esplin is in Arizona. Dr. Lamb is in the UK and England. They authored this protocol way back 15 years ago in 2000. Unfortunately, the only state in America that employs the NICHD is Washington State. So most everybody, including your state, I believe, in Missouri, uses what's called RATAC, R-A-T-A-C. So that stands for Rapport, Anatomical Identification, or Body Parts. Uh, touch Inquiry is the, is the first, uh, is, is the T. Uh, good touch, bad touch, or secret touch. Then the, the, the second A stands for abuse scenario, and then C is closure. The problem is a lot of the forensic interviewers don't go by the actual acronym. They, they skip around. You know, they might, they might not go over body parts. They might, they might not go over right from wrong or truth from lie or go over touch inquiry, you know. Tell me, what a, tell me what a good touch is, you know, a kiss on the cheek or a hug. Tell me what a bad touch is, you know, when somebody touches my pee-pee. Uh, they may not even go over that. So you can't assume that the child knows anything about any of that. You know, you have to question the kid. That's, that's why we have these forensic interviews. So it doesn't matter whether the kid is 3 or 13, you still have to go over all this. And why is it? You said sometimes when, when I guess, the child is uh, uh, goes through this uh, uh, interview, if you will, uh, why why is it always done in an appropriate way? So sometimes they skip over the steps. Why is that? Is it just I mean is that an accidental thing? Is it is it purposeful in some instances? Well, no, or? no, I don't. No, I don't think it's purpose. I don't think it's pur purposeful on the on the part of the interviewer. I, I think it's naivete, unwittingness. 
Um, I think I think the interviewer wants to get to the uh, meat of the meat of the matter, which is why they're there. And the allegation is that you know your father, uh, you know, fondled you or inappropriately touched you, um, you know, a seven-year-old girl or whatever. And and the reality is the best way to do this is what we call the blind interview, where the interviewer doesn't even know the index allegations. Because that way the interviewer doesn't suffer from what we call in psychology confirmatory bias and have a preconceived notion this already occurred. So instead of being presumed innocent, you're being presumed guilty. The accused, that is. Okay. And then in terms of leading questions, you had mentioned leading questions, and sometimes those are asked of uh, children in, in sexual abuse cases. What do you think of leading questions in, in, in those types well, of scenarios? Well, are they good or they bad? Yeah. Well, the, the NICHD method, which is the one that I, I mentioned about five minutes ago, which represents best practice methodology, that doesn't, that doesn't allow for any leading or suggestive questions. That one, you have to basically ask the kid, can you tell me what happened? Can you please tell me what happened? So the kid is, the kid is charged to basically tell the interviewer uh, through an open-ended question, a line of questions, free recall, free narrative, free account of what allegedly transpired. When you start using leading suggestive questions, which, which, which RATAC does allow, RATAC is a semi-structured, it's not a fully structured method like NICHD, it's a semi-structured method, it does allow leading suggestive questions. Then you're putting, you know, what, what is suggestibility? You're putting words and thoughts and ideas in the mind of the kid. See, you don't want that. You want the kid of the kid's own free volition to tell the interviewer what happened in, in, in his or her own words. Now, well, very, very interesting. Uh, yeah, if the kid no, is three ahead. or four, if the, yeah, if the kid is very, very young, three or four years old, then oftentimes you've got to use drawings, um, you know, you've got to use anatomical drawings or something, um, you know, to, to get the kid to identify, um, you know, because obviously the memory, the memory and um, the right brain formation is not as developed as it is in older kids with younger kids. So oftentimes they've got to use a tool or two to get the younger kids to, uh, you know, to, to report accurate information. What do you recommend for individuals that have been, I mean, in terms of falsely being accused of sexual abuse, how do they, how would they go about proving that the allegations are untrue? Well, not trying to sell my services here, but uh, clearly my website is approaching 900,000 hits. That's the population of a major U.S. city. Uh, it's been up on the Internet for 18 years, since 97. There's a reason for why I'm so busy. So, you know, there's plenty of information on my website without having to pay any money for you to click on uh, PDF uh, studies, law review studies, and, and scientific studies and information on this topic. Again, my website is abuse-excuse.com. All right. Anything else you want to tell the listeners about yourself in terms of your biography and what you've done? Well, I hold a master's degree in science, uh, in, in, in child forensic studies, in psychology and the law. So as, as a trial expert, because, um, you know, to my knowledge, you guys don't get this stuff in law school. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but you're not trained to try false child sex cases in law school. Again, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so, no, so you know, yeah. So, so as as an expert, I'm I'm trying to educate and lead the attorney to the promised land. So it's it's my job to help the attorney to help the client uh, clear his or her name uh, if if in fact they didn't perpetrate uh, you know the the acts they've been accused of doing. All right. Well, very good. So your web page, give everybody that web page address again. That way they can go and check it out. Yeah, it's abuseexcuse.com with a, with a dash or hyphen in the middle of it. Outstanding. Well, Mr. Tong, I really appreciate you coming on to the show today. It's been, uh, been a pleasure and an honor. Well, it's a pleasure for you to have me on, uh, uh, Mr. Stange, and I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Outstanding. Well, thanks again, and that will conclude today's episode with Family Law Talk with Stangy Law Firm. But uh, again, thanks to Mr. Tong for coming on. It was a privilege and an honor, and thanks for all the listeners for tuning in. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Family Law Talk with Kirk Stangy. Visit StangyLawFirm.com for more about today's topic or to put Stangy Law Firm to work for your family today.
Treat your party host with a high V party tray. From meat, cheese, and charcuterie boards to shrimp and seafood trays and everything in between, hy V has the perfect signature platter to make your event extra special. And make sure to check out the chicken wing trays if you want a real crowd pleaser. Shop in store or online at hi-v.com. That's hi-v.com. The holidays start here at Baker's with a variety of options to celebrate traditions old and new. You could do a classic herb roasted turkey or spice it up and make turkey tacos. Serve up a go-to shrimp cocktail or use Simple Truth wild-caught shrimp for your first Cajun risotto. Make creamy mac and cheese or a spinach artichoke fondue from our selection of Murray's cheese. No matter how you shop, Baker's has all the freshest ingredients to embrace all your holiday traditions. Baker's, fresh for everyone.